And part of the success of the LGBTQ movement has come from the way that they have framed the issues that we face. Instead of focusing on the morality of homosexuality or those kinds of behaviors, they have championed so-called LGBTQ rights as the, the next civil rights battle. And so if someone disagrees with homosexual behavior, they are viewed as being homophobic and standing in the way of another person's individual civil rights. And that begs the question then, is homosexual marriage a civil right or a moral wrong? And those who argue that it is a civil right, and now it is considered as such since 2015 when the Supreme Court legalized gay marriage, um, and uh, even more so recently with the codifying into federal law, uh, the Respect for Marriage Act, <clears throat> which will be signed by our president. They're defining sexual preference or orientation as part of the created essence of what it means to be a person. It's no different from skin color. It is the idea that a person is, is born oriented in a certain way, and that is something that cannot be changed. Therefore, that orientation is part of the essence of their personhood. But that's deeply flawed. If, if it were so that sexual orientation is part of the essence of a person, then people who have come out of a homosexual lifestyle and gone on to thrive in a heterosexual marriage, they shouldn't even exist. Because... Sexual orientation to our culture and to this world is something that is immutable. So former homosexuals are kind of like unicorns. But the reality is that sexual orientation is a behavioral, moral choice. One may have a predisposition toward homosexuality from even a young age, but it is still a choice to act on that desire. Despite what our culture teaches, we are not defined by, and we do not find our identity in, our sexuality or our sexual sins. The organic laws of the United States grounds our rights in our status as created beings endowed by the Creator Himself. The concept of rights come from the very word of God. Ultimately, civil rights flow from God and his word, and it is clear that we are created in the image of God, so then we have unique worth and value and dignity as a human. The Bible is clear that all humans are one race and that all are made in God's image. So starting with God's word, Christians can categorically reject things like racism or discrimination or other hateful attitudes and actions, but Scripture is equally clear that homosexual behavior violates God's design for biblical marriage, and sexuality outside of biblical marriage is sinful in God's sight. And on those grounds, understanding that our rights come from God, we know that homosexuality is not a civil rights issue. It is a moral issue, and it violates God's moral code. And many would argue that in allowing homosexuals to, quote, marry, that if we do not allow that, that is discrimination. Marriage is defined for us by God in His Word, and people want to borrow from this concept and then corrupt this doctrine of what it actually is the current laws in our United States regarding marriage discriminate on a, a wide variety of people. Children are not allowed to marry. Men cannot yet marry more than one person. No one can marry an animal. If homosexual, quote, marriage is a civil right, 
then where do you draw the line for other sexual behaviors that find desire in some people's minds and hearts? In the end, following this kind of logic, anything and everything has to be permitted. Homosexual desires are a consequence of living in a sin-cursed world. And just as those who struggle with heterosexual lust or greed or anger or gossip, etc., homosexuals are called to repent. They are called to place their faith in Jesus. They are called to live for His glory. They are called to obey His word by the power of the Holy Spirit. In 1962... School prayer was ruled unconstitutional. In 1963, Bible reading in public schools was deemed unconstitutional. In 1973, abortion was made legal. In 1985, nativity scenes on public land were ruled to violate the supposed separation of church and state. In 2015, homosexual marriage was deemed constitutional. And now in 2022, same-sex marriage is about to be codified into federal law. Human beings have many ideas about what is right or what is wrong. But as described in the book of Judges, as I began this entire study, everyone seems to be doing what is right in his or her own eyes. Only God, who created mankind, is in a position of moral authority over all of mankind. And his standard is not arbitrary, it is absolute. It is based on the unchanging character of the righteous, holy, and perfect judge of the universe. When we start with God's word, we are not prisoners to the changing tide of public opinion. Unlike the changing laws of our society, our creator provides a firm foundation on which we can base human morality. I don't declare homosexuality as sinful because I say so. I only do so because the authoritative word from our creator says that it is so. Now that might not be comfortable for everyone to hear, but it does not make it untrue. Those who engage in same-sex acts are in rebellion against their creator, just like every other sinner is. And all will one day stand before this God and give an account of their actions and their thoughts. And our desire is that they would repent and trust in Jesus and receive his free offer of salvation before it is too late. Now, saying what I've said in this class over the five different weeks we have met, and even the words that I just spoke, they are increasingly being condemned as hateful and intolerant. But the most loving thing a person could do is to direct somebody straight to Jesus. We all love people, and we recognize their inherent worth and dignity as an image bearer of their Creator, and we understand that they have an eternal soul that will dwell forever with Christ in heaven or forever without Christ in hell. So let me ask this question. What does it mean to be tolerant? That word encompasses the central dogma of today's enlightened culture. Sadly, in this culture, Everyone defines their own truth and autonomy. We have denied the law of God. People parade through personal expression and emotion as though that is the king of their life. As a result, intolerance of their position is seen as the most supreme evil. To more fully understand this sacred, secular, humanistic doctrine, the new, popular, contemporary understanding of tolerance must be contrasted to its traditional definition. I have a dictionary. It used to belong to my mother. It's from 1967. This is the definition in that dictionary of tolerance. 
being tolerant of others' beliefs and practices. That definition has been completely eradicated today. The current secular manifestation of tolerance demands so much more than a willingness to accept the existence of ideas that are contrary to my own. Here is what tolerance has come to mean in 2022. Not only enduring, but celebrating and conforming to contrary ideas and abandoning ideas that do not conform to the new progressive standard. Tolerance is anything but tolerant these days. And this should be a red flag to anyone with any logic. You see, saying something is tolerant when it is essentially intolerant is illogical. It's self-refuting. It's nonsensical. But of course, this superficially assumes the postmodern ideology of no absolutes and the equivalence of various contradicting truth claims. Secularists assume by blind faith that belief in absolutely truth or an absolute truth is absolutely wrong. That's a declaration ironically impossible within their own actual worldview. And this faith system is vehemently imposed even to the point of persecution of those who would be, quote, non-believers in this kind of ideology, namely Christians. In theory, if secularists truly believed their own definition of tolerance, they would celebrate, encourage, and empower those who hold beliefs that are different than their own, such as those who believe that marriage is only between a man or a woman. But for the secularist, this is not a two-way street belief system. As it turns out, it is only their ideas that require celebratory approval. They have no desire or inclination to reciprocate this practice to other views like biblical Christianity. There is an outright refusal by today's secularist to consistently apply and practice their own ultimate standard of tolerance. Their unofficial view is this, bow to our beliefs or we will attack you in one of many ways. Scaling the heights of hypocrisy, the secularist arbitrarily and strategically redefines tolerance as their view is the only one allowed. And this requires agreement, it demands compliance, and then it is bigotedly intolerant by the old or even the new definition toward anyone who would have an opposing view. To put the cherry on the top, anyone who dares to defy the progressive mantra is labeled as hateful, bigoted, intolerant, or any other epithet that they can think of. The secularist, quote, altar call proclaims that if you don't already hold to today's open-minded values, now is the time for you to repent and embrace them fully or else. You will comply or you will not be tolerated. Ironically, those who champion tolerance as their supreme creed unveil themselves as fantastically intolerant. Maybe you have heard about this story that was uh, out in the news just today, that Kirk Cameron has written a children's book proclaiming God, family values, mom and a dad raising a child to love people, love God. Well, what he wanted to do was, and as of today, by the way, as of today, he has not had one public library allow his book to be read not one and he's 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 asked for this to be done right now uh, or as of the writing of this story this morning in over 50 but even as of this afternoon when their publicist was still trying to get appointments set in public libraries in cities across america almost every single library has refused to allow him to do this 
Um, this, by the way, in many of the libraries where drag queen story hours are commonplace, the norm. Look at some of the responses to this story that are uh, out there on Twitter. One person said, well, this would be a good time to remind Kirk Cameron that being gay is natural and hating gay is a lifestyle choice. One person said, I'm hearing that libraries are doing their best to protect children from Kirk Cameron. Good for libraries. Another person, uh, I can't read it from here, but um, the other one shows examples of pastors who have betrayed their, their vows and have preyed upon children. And she is saying that basically it, children are more safe with drag queens than they are with clergy. So, and that, by the way, these are just, those are just four responses off of Twitter, off of literally, because his name was trending today on Twitter, and I don't know if you know about Twitter and trending and all that kind of stuff. Thousands of responses like this to Kirk Cameron and this story. Now, earlier I said that the secularist superficially assumes no absolutes. And I, I purposely chose superficially because the secularist actually does believe in absolutes in his or her heart of hearts, just not God's absolutes. The secularist actually elevates his own evil thoughts, his own evil beliefs to the level of absolute truth. That is why he or she is so bigoted and intolerant of anyone who would disagree with them. You either agree with what is, quote, unequivocally right in their view, or suffer the fate of every non-believer. In the secularist mind, whether they recognize it or not, their ideas, their word, has become the standard. This revelation exposes the foundational battle that we discussed in the very first week. God versus man. This goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. Either you Trust God or you become God. Either God is the authority in your, in your life or you reject God and you act as your own authority. It's fundamentally an authority issue. It is a clash between the word of God and the word of man. And currently, our secular culture is deceived into falsely believing it can define reality and morality apart from God and demand compliance. But God has not left his throne. He never left. He never will. And he alone, as our just and loving creator, can define what is right and what is good both now and for eternity. Everyone will be held accountable to the eternal judge, and in the long run, any lack of compliance to the word of God actually will not be tolerated. So let's talk about the rainbow. In recent times, the rainbow has come to represent sexual freedom. I would make the strong case it actually has come to represent sexual slavery. Homosexual pride, the, the new sexually immoral era, specifically the LGBTQ plus movement. But the rainbow itself was not designed to be a symbol of the homosexual movement. God created this beautiful, colorful phenomenon and designated it as a sign of his covenant with Noah and his descendants forever. Genesis chapter 9 verses 12 through 13 says, and God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. The rainbow stands as a poignant reminder that God is both merciful and just. 
Sadly, people ignore what God intended the rainbow to represent and proudly wave these multicolored flags in absolute defiance of God's command and design for marriage. Because of this, what is sad, many Christians shy away from actually using the rainbow. And that's a sad thing. Because the rainbow doesn't belong to a culture, doesn't belong to a movement. The rainbow was a symbol of God's promise long before the LGBTQ movement, and it will continue to be so after that movement is on the ash heap of history. As Christians, we need to resolve to, to take the rainbow back. And we need to genuinely be teaching its meaning, its symbol, to children, to teens, to everyone. The rainbow is God's design. He didn't have to make that. He's the one that designed it that when light would shine through water droplets, we would get this beautiful array of colors. He made it that way. And he did it with a purpose. So let's talk about hope the hope that we have in Jesus. We need to understand that no person is actually a lost cause. And when we have conversations like this, it's easy for us to begin to maybe write people off. But nobody is beyond God's saving grace if there is still breath in their lungs. Look at this scripture from Colossians chapter 4, verses 2 through 6. Paul writes to the church in Colossae, Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I'm in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And the famous evangelist Dwight L. Moody said that there was a painting that he saw early in his ministry that really impacted him in his life. And it was a portrait of a woman in the seas. And there was just great wind and uh, storm and the waves were high and the winds blowing. And she had both hands holding onto the cross. This is that portrait. I'm not so moved as he would have been by that. But he said the image of this woman trying to be saved by holding on to the cross in the midst of a tempest had a great impact upon his life. Until later in his ministry, he saw another picture, and I don't have that image. After the, he saw the second picture, he said this first picture didn't move him quite as much. But the second picture, again, was of a woman, and she is in the sea, and with one hand, she is holding on to a cross in the midst of a tempest. And with the other, she's reaching back behind her, reaching out toward her friend. And he said, that second picture was probably for him a better communication of what true Christianity is than the first. You see, if Jesus really is all supreme, if he is all sufficient, then we need to be looking for open doors so that people who don't know him, who don't believe him, and even right now may hate him, can meet him as well. And I'm including the most radical and militant LGBTQ activist in this. So how do we take advantage of a doorway with people like that? Well, notice something in that section in Colossians 4, 2 through 6. Notice something in those five verses. There are three times that Paul says, I want you to pray. See, here's the key that I, I, I get out of that. And that is that before you talk to men about God, you should talk to God about men. Notice how essential it is for you and I to be praying for people to be able to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Three times Paul calls on these Colossians to pray for open doors. Our tongue is a very powerful thing. 
So we need to be very careful how we use it. And I believe the highest and the most noble use of the gift of speech that we have is communicating with God in prayer. And when a Christian does not pray for or about lost people, he's either unconcerned or he has no burden for them or he's overconfident and doesn't think that he needs God's help in it. And any attitude along those lines grieves God's spirit. The Bible says that we should always be prepared to give an answer for the hope that you have. But you know what? People never ask it that way. I have never had a person walk up to me and say, Mike, would you give me the reason for the hope that you have? They don't ask it that way. But but if you listen, you can hear people maybe asking survival questions. Sometimes people talk about how tough it is to have a good marriage how hard it is to raise children. They talk about how difficult it is to live within your means and try to be content. They talk about how hard it is to not be scared of the future. They talk about not wanting to feel guilt about choices that they've made in their life. And the Christian who can anticipate when he hears those kinds of things is able to say, you know, there's only one thing that keeps me strong. In a moment like this in my life, it is my faith in Jesus. And just look for the open door and expect those open doors, especially if you pray for them. And I think it's important that we don't see people or interactions with people as interruptions. I think that a lot of times when we are on social media in particular, we can dehumanize people we see words we see ideologies and positions and we don't see men or women we don't see daughters or sons of god we just see these things and we respond and sometimes we don't do so in a way that honors the lord people are not interruptions in our lives they can actually be divine appointments We need to be praying about our interactions. I would say people are almost never argued into the kingdom. People cannot be bludgeoned into the faith. The message of grace must be delivered graciously. And I got to tell you, I'm always harder on a Christian than I am on a person who is not a believer. And I suspect for that very reason, more people have been turned off by the messengers of Jesus than by the message of Jesus. Our task is to be a witness. God sends me and he sends you into the world to tell people what Jesus has done, to to be witnesses for Jesus. And witnessing is not something that we do. It is something that we are. The Holy Spirit said, you will be my witnesses. That's who we are. And we live our days looking for doorways. And I want you to understand that a door is for going out, but it's also for coming in. So when God opens doors, it's not just for inviting people in. It's also so that you and I can go out and take the message of Jesus to other people, to to them personally. Jesus said that we need to go into the highways, into the byways to compel people to come to this wedding banquet. Can you imagine if a a brand new gas station opened up here in Des Moines? All of a sudden they got a problem. The service is, it's it's such a nice place. The pumps are so clean. The gas is really good. It's cheap. Refreshments inside are so tasty. People, they pull up. They just don't want to leave. They just want to stay. And that's what we do with church. You come, you get filled up. You're like, oh man, it's so nice. I love it here. You don't come to stay at the station. And you get filled up here to go back out into the world. We are not here to make a living. We're here to make a difference. And if you want to make a difference, then God will open doors for you if you pray for him to do so. I love this story, and 
I remember hearing this years back, it's a guy named Milton Cunningham who was a fairly well-known missionary and he had been on the mission field for many years. But he was on a plane back in the United States uh, and he was on furlough and was flying from Atlanta to Dallas, Texas. And you know, on one side of the plane, typically there's three seats and you know, somebody has to sit in that middle seat um, depending on the, the plane, I guess, that you're in, but that's the seat that Milton was assigned, this middle seat. So he's in the middle seat, and on his side in the aisle seat is this little girl. And he could tell when he sat down that she was mentally handicapped. She was a person with Down syndrome. So he sat down, he smiled, and a few minutes later he feels a tug on his sleeve. And she said, Mr., did you brush your teeth this morning? He smiled and he said, well, yes, honey, I, I did. She said, well, that's good. You should brush your teeth every day. A few minutes later, she tugged on his sleeve again. Mister, do you smoke? Well, no, I, I don't smoke. She said, well, that's good. You shouldn't smoke because it'll make you sick. A little later, she tugs on his sleeve. Mister, do you love Jesus? He said, yes, honey, I do. I love Jesus. I love him very much. And she said, that's good. Everybody should love Jesus. Right about that time, the other person who was going to sit next to him came in and he was a larger man. He kind of squeezed in and sat down on the window seat. And so there's a little girl, there's Milton, and there's this new gentleman that comes, this businessman. And the plane is taking off and after a couple minutes while they're in the air, Milton feels a tug on his sleeve. Ask him if he's brushed his teeth this morning. <laughs> and he, he just said, no, honey, he's, he's probably busy. Well, she just wouldn't leave, let him up. You know, she kept tugging on his, his sleeve. So he leans over. He said, excuse me, my friend, I'm, I'm really sorry, but she, uh, my friend here wants to know if you brushed your teeth this morning. And he looked over at her and said, well, yes, I did. And she said, good, you should brush your teeth every day. And Milton said, I knew where this was going to go. Well, she wouldn't let up, and finally, he said, you know what, my, my friend really wants to know if you love Jesus. And this man said, you know, I, I really don't know a lot about God, but there's been a lot of stuff happening in my life lately, thinking, you know, I better start looking into this thing. And so from Atlanta to Dallas, Texas, all of a sudden, Milton Cunningham, who was a missionary on furlough, found himself back on the mission field again. And I think that God wants to do that all the time in our lives. And it's an exciting way to live. And in reality, we, we need to remember what it is that is at stake with all of the things that you and I have discussed over these past several weeks. Eternity. Eternity is at stake in these people's lives. The people who have been deceived into thinking that homosexuality is acceptable or that there are more than two genders, those people need you and I to be willing to find a doorway into their lives to share with them the good news that God loves them and that the only hope that you and I have in this life is through Jesus and a relationship with Him. So that's what I got today. Do you have any questions or comments?